Often when someone does something horrible, you will hear things such as I never would have expected this from him. I doubt anyone said that about old Rocky Barton though. Rocky had been held in a Kentucky jail for nine years. The reason for that was a bloody story. Some women were just drawn to Rocky, and Rocky was certainly drawn to them, but he had his demons. He was violent and possessive with his wife back in 1993. The smallest of things could set him off, and his jealousy was like mold growing on his brain. One day it popped off, his wife had for some reason slighted him, and he flew into another rage. This time though it was more than just a beating, he took his shotgun and clubbed his wife in the head. After that he took out a knife and stabbed her three times before slashing her across the throat. Somehow his wife survived the ordeal and went to police as fast as she could. She had been left for dead by Rocky Barton, but she had managed to survive, and now they had him. I don't know why he only served nine years for what he did, he clearly tried to murder his wife. But that's just the beginning of the story. Rocky Barton was released in 2002, but a year before that, in 2001, he had remarried. He had married a woman named Kimberly Jo Reynolds. She knew what he was, she knew what he had done, but she fell in love with him nonetheless. A lethal mistake. As soon as Rocky was released from jail, he moved into a farm residence with his new wife. The residence had been owned by Rocky's father and set in Ohio. It didn't take very long for Kimberly to realize what a horrible person Rocky really was. He was manipulative, possessive and abusive, his mood swings were brutal, and he would constantly use violence to keep in control of the relationship. But Kimberly was a tough broad. She stood up to him and argued against him, she didn't take his shit. Barely a year had gone by when in January of 2003 Kimberly had had enough. She moved out and Rocky was angry and heartbroken. He at first tried to beg and persuade her to come back, but when that wouldn't work he began making phone calls to her. He threatened her and shouted at her. Nothing seemed to work for old Rocky. He had lost the control he so desperately had tried to hold on to. January 16, 2003. On this day Rocky began by making phone calls. Not to Kimberly, but friends and associates of the couple. He was complaining to them that Kimberly had left him and he was going to be sent back to prison. He was also talking about his quote-unquote demise, a haunting quote in hindsight. He called Kimberly again, but this time he sounded calm and collected. He had already accepted his fate in his head. Kimberly accepted his offer to come and pick some of her things up from the house and she brought her 17-year-old daughter with her that day. As they pulled up outside the gate, they saw Rocky's uncle Larry waiting outside the gate as well. It must have made her feel some calm knowing that she wouldn't have to be alone with Rocky, but it didn't really matter. Rocky let her through the gate and then quickly stepped inside the garage. Kimberly had barely stepped out the door of her car when Rocky came rushing towards her carrying a shotgun. You ain't going anywhere, bitch. He screamed as he stopped four feet away from her. He lifted his shotgun and shot her, hitting her in the side. Kimberly fell back into her daughter's arms, and as she struggled with the shock of what had just happened, Rocky shot her again, this time in the back. Kimberly was dead, and Rocky turned his head towards his uncle Larry and proclaimed, I told you I was insane before dropping down to his knees, putting the barrel of the shotgun under his chin, and pulling the trigger. Barton was a fucking idiot. The shotgun shrapnel had ripped Kimberly's lungs, heart and liver apart, but the blast Rocky had taken to his face only managed to do one thing. He blew his own fucking jaw off. 
He took a few surgeries, a few pins and screws, and all of a sudden the jaw was back in place. And he was ready to stand trial. But there was no more mercy for Rocky Barton. He had gotten a second chance and he had thrown it away. He was sentenced to death and on July 12th, 2006, he was strapped onto a table and injected with lethal injection. In his last words he said that he was sorry. He specifically spoke to Kimberly's daughter that had witnessed her mother's murder and told her, I'm sorry for killing your mama. I'm not asking you to forgive me. Not a day goes by that I'm not trying to forgive myself. Then he spoke to the executioner, saying, As Gary Gilmore said, let's do it. And like that, he fell into the deep sleep we call death. Today, Rocky Barton's corpse is rotting beneath the dirt. His first wife had to live with the trauma he caused. Kimberly had been murdered by him. Kimberly's daughter had to live with the memory of having her mother die in her own arms in such a sudden way. And Rocky himself just rotted away. It's so pointless, isn't it? It's so unnecessary. Benjamin Miller is one of those serial killers that very few people know about. And there is a lot of those out there. But he was an unusual serial killer. I have talked about this before, but serial killers usually stick to killing people of their own race. A white serial killer usually kills white women, or if he is gay, he usually kills white men. And the same goes for women. The exceptions are usually black men that kill white women, just like Carlton Gary who I covered in a previous video. But Benjamin Franklin was a white man that targeted black women. It was in Stamford, Connecticut between the years of 1967 and 1971 that Benjamin held the African American community in terror. During these years he strangled five young women to death, and the fact that they were prostitutes probably helped him because he doesn't really catch the eyes of authorities as easily. Prostitutes does after all live a dangerous life, and some of his victims were also known drug addicts. But despite that, the community was still in fear. There was some among them preying on the weak, someone among them killing their disgraced daughters. The bra strangler made his presence known on August 4th, 1967, that's when someone spotted a figure laying lifeless in a wooded area near the Merritt Parkway in Stamford. It turned out to be the corpse of 29-year-old Russell Rush. The bra strangler was far from done. His next victim was Donna Roberts, 22 years old. Donna was found on May 3rd, 1968, and just like with Russell, he had strangled Donna with her bra. Only four months went by when he struck again, this time he attacked 21-year-old Gloria Khan, only 200 feet away from where Donna Roberts' body had been found. The bra strangler had murdered three women and the community was struck with fear. But Benjamin Miller disappeared. He was gone, he didn't rear his head again until July 10, 1971. He had been gone for three years and everyone was sure that the bra strangler had died or been caught for another crime. But that wasn't the case at all. On July 10, he attacked Gail Thompson, 19 years old. Just like with his other victims, he strangled her to death. He looked into her eyes as her head turned blue and as life left her mind. He was back in the groove again and only six weeks went by before he murdered his final victim. Her name was Alma Henry and she was 34 years old when she died. It was on August 22, 1971 that Benjamin Miller threw himself over Alma and choked the life out of her. After she had died, he brought her corpse to the same dumping radius as he had dumped all of his victims. The community was afraid, but they were also very frustrated at this point. Their frustration eventually got the police to start moving forward and gather a task force. At first they were sure that they were looking for a black man, and I don't think that had anything to do with racism, even though I'm sure racism was a bigger issue back then, it's just not a logical conclusion. As I mentioned before, serial killers usually stick to their own race for some reason, 
But somehow the task force got a tip on Benjamin Miller. A white postal worker didn't seem like the man they were looking for, but they checked him out anyway. And it's a good thing that they did, because they soon noticed some psychological issues in Benjamin's background. And they also noticed that he had a preference for black ladies. Something that immediately pushed him up the list of their suspects. Benjamin was brought in for interrogation and denied killing anyone. All he said was that he had had sex with Gail Thompson on the night of her murder, but even though he denied it, some of his responses were odd. He mentioned details only the killer and the police would know. And these are details that haven't been released to the public, which is why the descriptions of the crimes are somewhat shallow. Because even though it's never mentioned, I am 99% sure that he raped his victims before, or maybe even after, strangling them. Just the fact that he brings them to a desolate area and strangles them with a bra suggests that his motivation is sexual. Also the fact that he had a thing for pretty young black ladies suggests that his motivations were sexual. And then we have the fact that he said he had sex with Gail Thompson. Why would he say that if there wasn't some sort of physical evidence on her body linking them? Some evidence that he had to make up an excuse for. That excuse being that they had consensual sex in his car. And maybe he didn't rape them, maybe he paid them and had sex with them and then killed them, but I doubt that too. The strangulation was clearly a part of his fantasy, so why would he blow his load before he even began acting out that fantasy? In short, I am certain that Benjamin Miller raped and then strangled five young African American women to death between 1967 and 1971. Tell me what you think below. Benjamin Miller also failed a polygraph test, and he seemed a bit off. It was quickly understood why he seemed off, as he was diagnosed with an undifferentiated schizophrenia. During an interview at this time, he confessed to killing seven women, and the whole thing was just a mess. Eventually though, he had to stand trial, but he was found not guilty by reason of insanity. That didn't mean he was able to walk free though, he was to be held at a psychiatric hospital indefinitely. A messy conclusion if you ask me. I don't know how crazy he actually was, but I do know that it would have been easier to make people think he was crazy for what he had done back in the early 70s. This was the first episode of a new series I'm introducing. It's a series for those cases that are just not big enough to warrant their own episode of Ages of Murder. It's also a series for those unknown serial killers. I tried to create a series before. That series was called Wild and Weird, but I quickly gave up on it. It just wasn't any fun to do, and the passion for it just wasn't there. Maybe I will create something similar in the future, and don't worry. Ages of Murder isn't going anywhere. So, I hope you enjoyed today's double feature.